Hey tribe of journeymen and women. So I just finished recording the previous episode about how I got a hundred students in my first few months of opening Aikido Dojo. And I realized I'm in a good space, uh, in the proper space to record this episode, which is kind of the follow up of, <laughs> so going from up to low of how I lost most of those students. And uh, why I think this is a good moment for me to record it is because I, I got in, into kind of this emotional space of feeling back into the time. And and that period, I have to be honest, was very emotional for me. It was a difficult time. And I don't even, I, I op, I, I'm an open book, you know, I share everything and I'll actually explain why I do that just in a moment. But uh, I, I am an open book, so I do tell that story about how I lost it. I never guide that. But I also, um, uh, I don't know if I really, I guess I, I sometimes I do interviews for podcasts uh, because of, you know, I'm known through martial arts journey and there's certain times when I'm invited to do a podcast and, and I mentioned that kind of, that happened. Maybe I mentioned it in a few videos, but I never really on record went through details of what specifically happened at, at that time and how it rolled out that that uh, my students lost faith in me and abandoned me, which uh, not, don't don't confuse it. It's not when I started my martial arts journey and questioned Aikido, that's not that. It was actually more related to my spiritual practice and my understanding of what's right and wrong. So anyway, I'll, I'll explain to you everything in the story. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of in that emotional space where I it's a tough subject, so don't expect me to cry <laughs> or something. I don't cry often, uh, for good or bad. But uh, but that's that. There is an emotional kind of uh, baggage there, and and I think it's uh, one of the reasons I'm sharing these stories with you is because I feel well. First of all, it's a quick side note, but when I started this new journey, people were concerned that I will be like a self-help guru guy, and they're like, oh. The last thing we need is another self-help guru guy. And the thing is, I hate that uh, whole world myself as well. And actually this story might be a very good one to, to explain why I don't like that whole culture of self-help gurus myself or gurus in general. But uh, also, also too, I don't want to be the one like that as well. And I think the best way to do that or, or to ask myself, like, what's the deal? Like, why do people hate self-help gurus like smart people and i think for a good reason and i think part of it is because they're pretentious they're like they something that worked for them they go out and tell you like oh this is how things work and i will teach you you know i will i know the way and i will tell you but the thing is we're all individuals we're all different and what applies to me doesn't necessarily apply to you and on the other hand instead of me telling what's right and what's what's wrong uh, i embrace the power of stories as i think stories they're such a good vehicle of sharing experience because what I went through, I won't tell you, you know, like this won't be a telling of you to you, like this is right or this is wrong, but I'll just share my emotion. I'll share my, my story and you can make your own conclusions. You know, it's a legit real story with hopefully enough emotional baggage so you could see that it's real and you could feel those emotions and hopefully you will take something valuable from it. So I'm not here to teach you something but I'm here to share and hopefully give you a chance to learn from my mistakes, at least to a degree. Uh, so yeah, that's the reason why I'm sharing this story and I'm sharing these stories when I'm making this video serious. I'm hoping that that's a great way to offer value because I expose myself and part of my character is, which I'm grateful of, is I do dive into the fire sometimes and I do get burned sometimes because of that as well. But that burning, they te that teaches me lessons which sometimes are unique or, or they're not easy to find and they're not easy to get. And uh, then they become valuable. And then uh, if this subject is interesting to you, then hopefully you can learn from where I got burnt from or gain some experience knowledge. Well, I think you got the message. So that's the intro. And without further ado, let's get going. So, and oh, okay, well, side note, you don't have to necessarily listen to the previous episode about uh, how I got those members in the beginning. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. But the story does continue that for the first few months of me opening my dojo, I was only 22 years old. I keep getting confused whether it's 21 or 22. 
I always forget, but I was young as hell. And back then at that day, it was funny because I thought that that's natural, like that's the way to go. I was like, a lot of people would tell me, like a lot of my students were way older than me, but they were like really, you know, loyal and respectful, which actually initially I was concerned about. I was like, oh, I'm 22 years old. How will people believe in me? So I, I told myself I need to do such a good job that they would. And I, I was able to pull that off. Initially, sometimes I had those funny cases where not everyone, but some adults would come in, especially in Lithuania, which is still kind of a bit of an old school country. It's changing, but it still is. Older people, they would come in and they wouldn't respect me at all because I'm this young guy. But by the end of it, after they would see how I teach and my, uh, they would see how much I know, they would suddenly change completely and they would be super respectful toward me. And that was funny. I was like, dude, come on, you know, be more authentic, be more yeah. honest. But anyway, so my, my most of my students were way older than me, and they were like, "Oh, Rokas, he's so young, and he knows this, and he knows that." And I was like, "What's the big deal?" And now I look back, I'm like, "Holy shit! How did I pull that off when I was 21 or 22? Holy crap!" You know, I'm surprised to this day. Now, now I realize that that was exceptional, that was unusual. But back then, it seemed to be normal because I haven't seen that much of the world. I haven't. You know, had so much independence. I hadn't lived in this reality that most people live in. My reality was I finished high school and I went to this spiritual school and whatnot. So, so my unique, my experience was unique and, and my understanding of what is reality was different than most of people's. And that was actually one of the problems. But so, uh, I uh, initially I was just so passionate and so enthusiastic and, and so driven and and I believed 100% in what I was doing, and also believed 100% in what my Aikido teacher did. And he was a very significant, uh, influential uh, individual in my life, personality. Uh, I, I, I worshipped him. I was super loyal to him. I didn't question him whatsoever, which again was my mistake. But also too, you know, I was 22, and I wanted to really become the best Aikido instructor possible as soon as I can, and I figured that if I just blindly, completely follow my Aikido instructor, then I will get there faster. Because I saw some people questioning and doubting, sometimes for good reason, but sometimes just like, you know, being dicks. And I saw that that inhibited their progress. Like if you question everything, like a, like a dickhead, then you will, you know, you won't get anything. And I decided to go the opposite way. So I completely was devoted to him, completely faithful. And to some degrees it worked out, you know, I learned some lessons the quick way and some of his advices were good. But obviously, you know, there was some shit between that too and I took that as well. And that's kind of the point of the story. So, we're in 2012, a few months in, my students are completely in love with what we're doing and, and they're devoted to me and so on. And I even had like a Nuchideshi program as well, which is a living student program where you have people living in your dojo. And I had this young guy living in my Aikido school and learning from me all the time. And I would you know, consult him. I was like, I was doing what my Aikido instructor did as well. It wasn't just Aikido, it was also kind of this self-help guru thing where I would go to meetings with my students and I would share them my wisdom. You know, and some of it was good, some of it was not as good, but I was sincere and I, I didn't want to sell something just to sell. I just I really spoke about things I believed in. And so I was trying to support people in their personal growth. And that was part of the whole community we had. It was about self-growth, about achieving your goals and so on. And, and, and most of the stuff, part of the stuff was what from what I learned from, from my personal experience. Part of it was things I took from my teacher and I believed to be true and I kind of passed it on. You know, meditation, knowing yourself, enlightenment, whatnot. I spoke about that in a few, a few other episodes. Now, the thing is, which was a crucial part, is I think like six months, it was comp everything was just like super good. But, and I don't want to go into this part too much, but that I learned actually years later, uh, just fairly recently when I got divorced, was like, I don't know, eight months ago or so, officially. It was a longer process, but but I might, my students told me to me that they did feel like when I got into that relationship, that actually changed. And I think it was true. 
Like the first six months, I was completely devoted to my students. My heart was, it was my whole life was about them, improving their lives. And when I got into a relationship, I guess, you know, partly that's human, uh, I got more focused also on the relationship uh, of living with my ex, now ex. And, uh, but also, so I don't want to go into this too much, but she was also very demanding. I can admit that, you know, she, she wanted, she, she, she did give me some space and freedom, but also she, she, she was very clear about setting her boundaries and, you know, not wanting me to spend too much time with my students. And she sometimes felt like my students were abusing me. Now that I look back, I don't think that was a fair statement, but, but she kind of also wanted to protect me and, and held me back. And I think my students started to, to feel that, that I'm not as devoted to them as I was before. So that was part of it. But actually, I think the more important part was that uh, after about six, seven, eight months, uh, there's a few different layers here, but, but one of the main ones is I started to see the same problems happening in my dojo, in my community that I built, the same problems that I witnessed and experienced in the community I was living in, in Switzerland, the Aikido school. And that was surprising to me. I thought, look, these are different people. This is a, to a degree, a different culture. I'm a different person as well. So why the hell are the same internal community problems coming up in, uh, in, in my community? And I'll tell you more about what they were, but, but I was surprised. I was, I was kind of caught off guard and I thought this is kind of suspicious. And part of it was probably the biggest one leaving me on a cliffhanger so I could drink my coffee, was that my students were respectful of me, but they were also afraid of me. <laughs> Super interesting to, to think about that. Now that, that you look back, I was like 22 years old, right? I think that was, and my students were, some of them like 40, 50. Some of them were younger as well, but, but most of them were like, they, they were completely loyal, devoted, respectful, but also afraid. They were afraid to fail in front of me. They were afraid to make a mistake. They were afraid to say the wrong thing, I guess, because they just really idolized me. And that was part of the problem. They really felt like I'm some, some out of this world human being. You know, I was, I was their spiritual teacher and I was this, I was so passionate and devoted about everything that they felt that I'm something else, I'm beyond. And again, that was one of the problems. But the thing is, to a big degree, that's exactly what my Aikido instructor did as well. And not like he would come in and I didn't do that either. Not like you would come in and be like, I am a special human being, respect me, no. But, but that came across through other acts and messages, kind of internal, kind of subconscious messages, the way you act. What I realized to be my mistake, I think later, was that I didn't share, I shared only the positive sides of my life. I only, I was devoted to being an ideal human being and I didn't share with my students the dark sides of my life. Like if I had trouble with my relationship or if I had some financial troubles, I, I kept that aside because I thought I need to be perfect with them in order to inspire them. The thing is they believed it. The thing is they, they took that as reality. They really thought I'm some kind of a perfect human being and that inspired them. But also when I started to fail when I started to do human mistakes, when my limitations started to come out, because look at the fact that I was 22 years old, I didn't know so many things. I didn't have like a proper relationship. I, I didn't understand how money works. There were so many things I was missing. And when that started to come out, my students suddenly were a bit in a crisis. They were like, wait, Rokas is not perfect? What the fuck? And I always see like, suddenly like he's a human being and that was kind of shocking to them. Part of that also came through me giving them less attention, me being more with my former partner. But, uh, but yeah, so it was a whole mix. And part of it was me understanding that my students are developing certain qualities which I wasn't happy about. And that was like, I, I realized it's not healthy that my students are afraid of me. And as I mentioned, I was surprised that that was, I realized that was the same, that was the same uh, dynamic, the same dynamics applied in the community I lived in Switzerland. We were 
most of us were afraid of my Aikido instructor. We respected him, but we were also afraid, me in particular. I never wanted to fail him. I always wanted to make sure that I do only the right things. And he, in a way, he punished us for mistakes. I remember like me and my roommate, my black belt brother, Aikido black belt brother, who was a great guy. We, but we were both similar age. I was like 20, 19, 20. He was like 22, 23. And we both kind of did something we, that we knew that our Aikido instructor might not approve of. And I don't remember what it was, but it was definitely like something small now that I look back. And we were walking towards the dojo and we're both freaking out. We're like, holy shit, we're gonna get shit for this. Our Aikido instructor's gonna kill us. And we're both just literally were afraid of what he's gonna say. And, uh, and he wasn't like an evil dude, you know, like he wasn't one of those shouting guys or whatever. It was, it was subtle. But he would, he would give you a very hard time for making some mistake. Although officially you're like, you learn from mistakes and blah, blah, blah. But then if you fail, he would let you know that. And another terrible thing which I took from him, he would never accept blame. Very rarely, very rarely. Most of the times, and that was like a reoccurring pattern that I re later realized. I personally now believe through my life experience that there's, you know, there's always, metaphorically, there's always two drivers at fault. Like one maybe is more responsible, but the other one was also in the wrong place at the wrong time. At least 95% of the time, right? So there's always like, if there's some shit happening, there's always responsibility on both sides. And in the previous video, I mentioned to you that my philosophy is you always have to ask yourself, like, what did I do wrong in this, in this shit that happened instead of blaming the other one? Unfortunately, my Aikido instructor, he, he used to be very much focused on what did you do wrong? Like heavily. He was never wrong. Very rarely. And now that I look back, like oftentimes, like he was not fair. You know, he was saying the wrong thing. He was, he was too judgmental. He was too heavy. He actually oftentimes created the conditions for our failure. Let's say, didn't explain well enough what we should do or, or something like that. But it was always our fault. You know, he always had that kind of draw to, to tell you what you did wrong. He was very good at making you think that it's all your fault. And I think I took that on a certain level. So one of the one of the things I took from him, which was again kind of his way of acting, was always showing you only the good side of yourself, kind of trying to create that image that you're perfect in a, in subtle ways. And the other one was blaming you, you know, giving you a hard time for making a mistake. And I did those both things because I thought that works. I was embodying my teacher also, obviously I had my own vibe, I had my own methods, but a big part of me was trying to replicate what my Aikido instructor did in order to achieve the, the same great success he had. But the thing is, I realized that by replicating him, I replicated not only the successes, I also replicated the shit that was happening in his community. And there was a lot of shit, trust me. Now that I look back, there's some dark stuff happening there. Not like, you know, child pornography or something. Don't want to give you that hint, but, but just like human dynamics, there was, there was a lot of, un, there were a lot of unhealthy dynamics, which I was part of. And I realized I brought those unhealthy dynamics of the community into my dojo. And I, and when I, when I started to see that, I was like, holy shit, I don't want that. I don't want my students to be afraid of me. I don't want them to, to actually, that was also, the thing is that I was also developing a relationship where there was no independence. It was the opposite of independence. People were super dependent on me. They didn't make their own decisions, didn't make their own choices because they always felt like they have to call me and check about every decision because they were helping me run the dojo. You know, some of, I made them, some of them are like instructors. I give them some of my classes and so on. They were really involved, but they always had, they always felt like they need to check things with me. They always wanted to make sure that I was happy about those things. And that made them dependent, which is terrible. That's not what you should do with people. You should empower them. You should give them the ability to make their own decision, not the other way around. <sighs> I need a cliffhanger in order to drink my coffee, but I think I'll just drink it now. I'm just taking a break because now this is a bit emotional. So, 
when I realized that, uh, now let's go back to, so you kind of know the whole setup now, uh, something that's come to the moment of my students starting to abandon me. So one part was them realizing I'm a human being, that I'm not perfect, but also I made sure to do that too, because I realized internally, intuitively, I realized that's the right thing to do. When I understood that, my students think I'm perfect and they idolize me way beyond healthy standards, that they're thinking I'm some perfect human being and you know they're striving to be like that too. I realized that's not real, that's fake. I don't want them to go that way. So I actually started to dim down the perfectness and also allow myself to be more human with them. I started to talk more about my own shit. I started to, to allow myself to fail in front of them and to admit my failure. I allowed myself to admit the sites that I did wrong. And that was initially, that was like a pretty terrible experience because I had like a core group of students who were helping me run the dojo. And, uh, and one day I realized, you know what? I need to do this. I need to let them admit my mistakes, which beforehand I didn't do because I followed the teachings of my teacher. And they, when they saw that they have that opportunity, there was so much they had in store. Beforehand, they were afraid to tell me that, what I did wrong, the, the mistakes I made, the things they did not approve of that I'm doing, but they respected me so much that they held that back, they held it inside, or talked between each other again about that, but not with me, uh, which is again, a terrible thing. And then I gave them the conditions to to let me know what they think I'm doing wrong. And there was just so much. There was so much, you know, for like an hour. I remember that quite vividly. We were sitting in the dojo and they were just like, you know, I didn't like it when you did this and then that and then that and then that. They were kind of eating me alive and that was painful. But I knew I had to, internally and truly, I knew I have to go through this. I need to set the balance straight. Maybe, you know, I wasn't smart enough. Maybe I should have set some limitations. But that's what I did. You know, I made that therapy for myself. I was like, okay, give me all that shit. But I think for them, that was also really difficult because that made them admit that I'm not perfect. And that's, that started to, to create the process of them losing faith in me. And again, I said, it's kind of painful to look back because, <sighs> you know, I don't wanna, I, I, and this is not, so I'm not gonna do what I'm saying that you shouldn't. I'm not, I'm not about putting blame on my students. You know, I can't say it's their fault, but, but it was painful for me to kind of realize that it just feels like they, because I only introduced the part of me, I only introduced the idealistic, the perfected part of myself, that, that I started to, to, to realize they were loving only the, the, the the good side of me. They were loving the sensei side of me. And, and you know, some people mis, 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 misunderstand this. Some people think, some people think that, you know, I was pretending to be someone I wasn't. And it wasn't true. Like maybe, you know, I was replicating some parts of my teacher, but I was really honest. I was really authentic. I was really like, that was me, but it was only p part of me. I wasn't showing the dark side of myself and the, the weak side of myself, which we all have. But then I realized that's the part which my students fell in love with. The part where I was semi-perfect, you know, perfect in their eyes. And when they started to realize I'm not perfect, that started to, they started to lose faith in me. They thought, so why are we believing what he's saying? And some of the stuff I said was good. Some of the stuff I said, I still believe in myself. I was still teaching the things only which I really felt were true. I wasn't trying to, you know, fake true but they started to disregard everything because suddenly they, they felt like I was not, you know, I was fake. They didn't recognize that there were good stuff as well. Like, I'm kind of going in circles here. But yeah, so, so they couldn't take my, the, they couldn't, uh, in my interpretation, they couldn't accept the fact that I wasn't perfect. And the more I admitted that I'm not perfect, I think the harder time they had. And suddenly I started to feel and see that my students are leaving me. They started coming in less. 
starting being less enthusiastic. And I understand why, again, I take my own, I admit my own mistakes. And I admit that, you know, I kind of created my own downfall. But it was painful, you know, we had such a close relationship. I give them so much and then suddenly I'm like, I see they're looking at me and they're, they kind of look at me as a failure. Some of the students stayed. Obviously the passion was never again like that before. I guess we were a bit of a cult <laughs> in that way, like the, the ultra passion. But yeah, and it was a hard time because I felt, I felt, I realized at that moment that I don't have any more, I don't have any friends. I realized my students were not my friends. They were only, I think friends, you know, friends accept you for who you are. They love you for who you are. They love your both sides. My former students loved only the perfect side of me. I couldn't come to them. They felt uncomfortable when I started to transform and I tried to balance out the, the scales and I would come to them and, um, and I would talk about my shit. You know, I'd be like, oh, you know, I had difficulty here. And I felt they were uncomfortable listening to that. They didn't want to admit, they didn't want to hear that I'm not perfect in the way. And so, uh, yeah, so students started to drop down, numbers dropped down, and I could still, you know, sustain the dojo. I had a lot of kid students, yoga students were not involved in that. I was more kind of just teaching yoga, I wasn't like creating a movement. People love my yoga, although, you know, it's a whole different subject. But, uh, yeah, stay with me, I'm just gathering my thought here. Um, so the number dropped down and I, and I felt like I have no, I realized that I have no friends. I had zero friends in the city. Everybody knew me as that sensey guy. And even funny enough, I just remembered that also reflected in the level of the whole city because the whole city, I was kind of well known in that city in Chile. People were, a lot of people were looking up to me, even people who didn't know me. And beforehand, like I did not allow myself to drink beer outside. I didn't want to give a bad impression about myself. I did not allow myself to get drunk, you know, I always try to give that, I always try to give the best of myself to people. And then I started to, uh, you, know, I, you know, try to become more human. And people were actually, even people who didn't know, they were not happy that I was drinking alcohol outside. I learned that, you know, from other people. They were like, oh, look at that yoga instructor, he's drinking beer? What the fuck, he's a fake. Look, you know, he's not a real yoga instructor, he's drinking wine. Ugh. That was like a legit thing. Like some people started to hate me because again, I was human. And that was painful. That was a painful period when I realized I don't have friends and people are judging me for being human. I felt like I couldn't be a human being. I felt like I couldn't be myself. And I came to a wrong conclusion then. I came to a conclusion that I cannot make my students friends because when I started to be more friendly with my students, they also, I felt like the respect level completely disappeared. They started to take me as a friend. They're like, ah, oh, whatever, whatever Roku says. And I understood that I do need to have some authority on some level. And you know, I don't want to go on a tangent here. It's a whole story there too, but kind of the point of it was the students that I made into friends weren't my students anymore. So I was like, I, tr I was troubled and I was trying to guess. So what, I was trying to find a way. I was trying to find, so what works? And uh, for a moment I thought I can't be friends at all with my students. And then I kind of distanced, my, distanced myself and I was kind of shutting myself in and that was painful too. And then eventually I started to realize, you know what? It took a while, but I realized, you know what? I need to own my shit. That's also too when I read the book, Always Start With Why by Simon Sinek, which was a very influential book for me. And straight, I started thinking like, why am I doing this and how should I do it the best way? So there was a whole transformation process. But eventually what I realized was that you know what, I need to own my human side. And I realized, you know what, I'm not like everyone else. There's a story, I'll, quick, I'll say it in a quick way, but a lion cub gets dropped, grows up in between uh, sheep. And he decides that he's a sheep himself. And he acts like a sheep. And one day, a while later, another lion comes in hunting. And he starts to hunt the sheep and suddenly he sees the lion, the sheep lion, running away from him. He's like, what the fuck is this? And he runs after the sheep lion, drops him down, puts him on the shoulders. And he's like, what the fuck, man? Why are you running from me? And the sheep lion is like, oh, no, 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 don't kill me, lion. I'm just a poor sheep. And the lion's like, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? 
It's like, uh, he's like, do you think you're a sheep? And he's like, I am a sheep. And he's like, no, you're a lion. And the sheep lion is like, no, I'm a sheep. What the fuck are you talking about? Sorry for swearing a lot. But so the, the lion gets frustrated. He's like, okay, you're just hopeless. Let's, let's go. Let me check, by the way, how much camera time I have. I think I'm starting to get out of limit. It's not showing. Holy crap. How do I know? Anyway, I think I have like 10 more minutes left on the, on the, on the thing. Yeah, nine. Anyway, so he pulls the sheep lion to the well, to the lake, and he puts his face in front of the lake and says, what do you see? And he's like, I see a lion. He's like, well, that's you. He's like, no, that's not me. That's just a lion. And he's like, he, the, the older lion gets frustrated. Gets frustrated. And he's like, no, look, roar. And the young lion, the sheep lion, he's like, I don't know how to roar. He's just like, just listen to me and just roar. And the sheep lion just roars. And he's like, holy shit, I am a lion. <laughs> I read the story a while ago, and that story actually kind of helped me transform because I realized that the point of that story, there's numerous points, but the main point that I had in my mind was if you hang around, and this is a bit bold, but, but you know, stay with me. If you hang around sheep, but you're a lion, it doesn't mean, and if you act like a sheep, it doesn't, you're still not a sheep. If you're a lion, you're a lion. And the thing I kind of realized at that transformational point that one of the mistakes I also did from being perfect, trying to you know, show only my perfect side, I kind of started to show only my human side, only my casual side. And I think that that didn't work either because my students were like, so why should we learn from him? He's, you know, he's the same like us. And I kind of realized, you know what? I'm not the same like you. I am a very devoted person. You know, I worked my ass off to become an Aikido instructor. You know, I took risks, which most people don't. And every fucking day, I work my ass off to be able to offer something to you. My discipline is, is better than most people's, most of my students. And I knew shit that they didn't, especially at that specific realm. And so I shouldn't pretend like I'm just some regular guy who knows nothing and by the side I teach Aikido. I was like, I know my Aikido shit. I know my meditation shit. I still think I sucked at yoga, but that's a different story. But, uh, but yeah, so I, um, I realized, you know what? I'm a lion and I have to be a lion, but I need to be a lion who owns his shit. I'm not perfect, but I'm not a nobody either. I'm a mix. And that's what I'm going to own. And I think that's when things started to pick up again.